Good morning. Welcome to worship on this beautiful day, and a special welcome to all of you joining us online as well. I'm Pastor Justin. We are so glad that you've chosen to be with us today in worship as we continue this series, Building a Great Church. Uh, we'd encourage you, to, if you pull out the connection cards in your seat back pockets in front of you or the link that is online, to fill that card out. A great way for us to be in prayer for you in the upcoming week as well as to celebrate anything that's going on in your life. So feel free to jot those things down as well. And we encourage you to just kind of wave to everybody. Shout, hey, the masks are almost gone. <laughs> so we are really excited about being able to be here and that you're here. So may God bless us as we come together. Let us stand then and worship today.
turn to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for who you are, that you are a God who loves us, who pursues us to the very end. And so in these moments, Lord, we come to bring in our tithes and our offerings back to you as a symbol of our devotion, our commitment, and our thanks for all that you have done for us in Jesus Christ. We ask this in the precious name of our Lord and Savior. Amen. There are four baskets located on each side of the room that you may move to to bring your tithes and your offerings. If you're joining us online, you can go to mymw.org and click on Give to give there as well. So let us move and bring our offerings to the Lord.
brothers and sisters in Christ. Baptism is the sign and the seal of the new covenant in Christ, an outward symbol of an inward action, symbolizing death to sin and resurrection to new life in Jesus Christ. Through the sacrament of baptism, we are initiated into Christ's holy church. We are incorporated into God's mighty acts of salvation and given new birth through water and the Spirit. All of this is entirely by God's grace, a gift that is offered to us without cost and without price. Through membership, we renew the covenant that was declared at our baptism. We acknowledge the grace of God and affirm our commitment to Christ's holy church. Today, I present to you Jim and Sharon Howen's child, who come to be received into membership at the church. As you come forward. So the earliest and the simplest statement of the Christian faith is the Apostles' Creed. It reads as follows. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, from which he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Church of Jesus Christ, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Do you affirm this faith? I do. On behalf of the whole church, I ask you, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sin? Yes. Do you accept the freedom and the power that God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? Yes. Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in his grace, and promise to serve him as your Lord in union with the church which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races? Yes. Do you receive and profess the Christian faith as contained in the scriptures of the Old and New Testament? According to the grace given you, will you remain a faithful member of Christ's holy church and serve as his representatives in this world? Yes. As members of Christ's universal church, will you be loyal to the United Methodist Church and do all in your power to strengthen its ministries? Yes. As members of this congregation, will you faithfully participate in its ministries by your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness? And I also ask you, the congregation, will you nurture these before you in the Christian faith and life and include them in your care and your prayers? Yes. Will you, with God's help, proclaim the good news and live according to the example of Christ before them? Will you surround them with a community of love and grace and forgiveness that they may grow in their trust of God and be found faithful in service to others, and will you pray for them that they may be true disciples who walk in the way that leads to life? Well, members of the house of God, I commend Jim and Sharon to your love and your care. Do all in your power to increase their faith, to confirm their hope, and perfect them in love. We give thanks for all that God has given the two of you, and we welcome you in Christian love. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for Jim and Sharon and all that you have done in their lives to bring them to this point of commitment to you and to this body of Christ. Lord, we ask that your blessing would be upon them, that in the days and the weeks and the months ahead that you would strengthen them and grow them as true disciples of Christ, that they might become like you in everything that they do and say. And so now may the grace of God who has called us into eternal glory in Christ Jesus, has strengthened you and establish you by the power of the Holy Spirit, that you may live in grace and peace. Amen.
if you will join me in welcoming them. Thank you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you today, Lord. We know that you love us so much. And we know, Lord God, that there are all kinds of things that we have brought into this space today. Things that may keep us from hearing your words. Things that could distract. Things that could lead us to places that you don't want us to be. So I pray that in these moments, Lord, that your spirit would speak. And that you would wash all of that stuff away. Pour out your grace upon us again that we might receive your cleansing presence. And in these moments, speak to us. Speak to us with boldness and with conviction. Speak to us in ways that even my words cannot convey. That your truth would be planted deep within us and in their season that they would bear a harvest. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. Our reading for today comes from Acts chapter 4, verses 1 through 22. Let us hear the words of the Lord. The priests and the captain of the temple guard... And the Sadducees came up to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. They were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. They seized Peter and John, and because it was evening, they put them in jail until the next day. But many who heard the message believed And the number of men grew to about 5,000. The next day, the rulers, elders, and teachers of the law met in Jerusalem. Annas, the high priest, was there. And so were Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and the other men of the high priest's family. They had Peter and John brought before them and began to question them, by what power or what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a cripple and are asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised From the dead, that this man stands before you healed. He is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the capstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished and took note because these men had been with Jesus. But since they could see the man who had been healed standing there with them, there was nothing they could say. So they ordered them to withdraw from the Sanhedrin, and then conferred together, what are we going to do with these men, they asked. Everybody living in Jerusalem knows they have done an outstanding miracle, and we cannot deny it. But to stop this thing from spreading further among the people, we must warn these men to speak no longer to anyone in this name. Then they called them in again and commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, Judge for yourselves whether it's right in God's sight to obey you rather than God. For we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. After further threats, they let them go. They could not decide how to punish them because all the people were praising God for what had happened. 
For the man who was miraculously healed was over 40 years old. This is the Word of God that is spoken for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, it was April the 20th of 1999. Littleton, Colorado, the scene, Columbine High School. Most of you probably remember that day. It was the morning that Dylan Klebold and Eric Harris went on a shooting spree in the school. They killed some 13 students, wounded 21 others, before finally turning the guns upon themselves. Still today, it ranks as one of the deadliest mass shootings in U.S. history. And in the days that were immediately after that event, some stories began to surface in the news about three students in particular. Students by the name of Rachel Scott, Cassie Burnell, and Valine Schnur. And these were students who paid the ultimate price for their faith in Jesus Christ. So the stories go, as, they, as these gunmen were walking through the school, they went up to each and every one of these students and they asked them, are you a Christian? Are you a Christian? And each of them, with boldness and courage, said, yes. Yes, we are. And even in the face of certain death, they made a choice. They made a choice that they were going to testify to their faith in Jesus Christ. A choice that they were going to speak up and refuse to be silenced. Even in that moment, they made the bold and courageous choice to stand for Jesus Christ. And they were killed for it. It was 1962. It was now Game 7 of the World Series, and the New York Yankees were playing the San Francisco Giants. The game was going fairly well, and there was the second baseman of the New York Yankees, a man by the name of Bobby Richardson. Now, Bobby was known to be a very strong Christian. This was the guy who was known to lead Mickey Mantle to Jesus Christ in his life. And, and so this guy was constantly sharing his faith with the people on his team. And, and so they were in the midst of this game. Things were going well. And, and there was a man on second base from the San Francisco Giants. And the Yankees decided, okay, it's time to change pitchers. And so they sent out the new pitcher, to warm up, and while he was warming up, Bobby decided he was going to take advantage of this opportunity. And he turned to the man that was there on second base and said, do you know Jesus Christ? And he started to share his faith with him right there in the middle of the game. Eventually, the guy reached home plate, he got back to the dugout, and he went into his fellow teammate, Philippe Alou, another man that he knew to be a believer in Jesus Christ, and he said, how in the world can you people talk about Jesus in the Game 7 of the World Series? You see, Bobby Richardson knew that there was something more important than a game of baseball that was going on that day. That there was something of incredible urgency and importance that had to be communicated. There's a story about a missionary, and he, he would tell this story in Africa about this elderly woman who had just come to faith in Jesus Christ. Now, this woman was quite old. She, she was blind. She couldn't read. She couldn't write. But she had just come to faith in Jesus Christ, and she really wanted to share her faith desperately. And so she asked the missionary if she could have a Bible, and she told him to to underline John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whosoever should believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And so he, he took this book and he underlined those words in the Bible. And he was really curious about what in the world a blind woman who couldn't read or write was going to do with this book. And so he decided he was going to follow her. And he followed her, and he, what he found out was every single day after, about the time that school would let out in that area, she would make her way to the doors of the school. And as the, the children were coming out after school, she'd ask each and every one of them, do you know how to read? And, and they would say, yes. And so she would say, read this verse that's underlined in the Bible. And they would read it out loud, and she would go on to tell them about the good news of Jesus Christ. 
And in fact, because of that, several people came to know Jesus as their Savior, and 24 of those boys went on to become pastors later in life because a blind woman that couldn't read or write knew that she had to share about her faith in Jesus Christ. Now, we are currently in a series that is called Building a Great Church. And throughout this series, we have been looking at what it was that made the early church in the book of Acts really tick. You know, what enabled them to truly change their entire world in just 40 years? Right, just a single generation for the gospel to spread from Jerusalem to Judea and Samaria and to the ends of their entire known world. And we've seen throughout this series that great churches are churches that pray together. We've seen that great churches are churches that are guided, empowered, and filled with the Holy Spirit. We've seen that great churches keep Jesus Christ and the message of His good news at the center of everything that they do. We've seen that that great churches love and care for each other in radical ways and that great churches have a a, a laser-like focus on those people who are on the outside, who are around them in the community, that they seek to meet their heartfelt Needs, not just the the needs that are on the surface, not just the things they express, but the things that are really at the depth of who they are. And today we are turning to the topic of faith sharing. Faith sharing. Because what we see in Acts is a church that is constantly telling people about Jesus Christ. Nothing stops them from doing this. Every way they go, they are sharing their faith with just about everybody that they meet. They share it in the synagogues. They share it in the marketplace. They they share it at a a group of philosophers that are meeting at the top of Mars Hill. They, They are constantly sharing their faith everywhere they go and nothing, not even persecution, is going to stop them from being able to do this. It's so critical to what they are doing, so critical to the life of the church that these are are, are men and women that had to share their faith in Jesus Christ with everybody. And so take a look at our text for today. I want to kind of set the scene for you a little bit. Peter and John, they've just healed the crippled man that we talked about last week. All right, that's, that's just happened. The man has jumped to his feet. He's went with them into the temple. He's been worshiping and praising God and naturally all the people in the temple who'd been passing this guy by for the last 40 years see what's happened. They're they're amazed, astonished that this man who had been crippled from birth is now walking about, jumping around, praising God in the temple and they realize that something supernatural has occurred here. And so they go to Peter and they go to John and they they start to say, what in the world is going on with this man? And they use that as an opportunity to tell them about Jesus because Jesus is at the center, right? They start to talk about his life, his death, his resurrection. They start to talk about how they need to repent and to believe in Jesus Christ for their salvation. And, and And they gain such a large crowd that it captures the attention of the religious leaders in the temple. And so they gather together, the chief priests and the Sadducees and the temple guard, they gather together and they come to find out what's going on. And they hear them preaching about Jesus, calling people to faith, calling to repentance, and the Bible tells us that they are greatly disturbed. Greatly disturbed by what they hear about this Jesus. Literally, that term disturbed means they're deeply troubled, displeased, offended, irritated, and exasperated by what they hear. Right? This is not just a subtle kind of so-and-so kind of offense. This is something that they are deeply, deeply moved by. They realize that this is going to be a problem, that they are starting to disrupt the status quo, and if things keep going on the way they're going, 
the fact is Rome's probably going to do something about it, and that's a problem for their power. It's a problem for, for their uh, ability to control the people in the temple. And so they arrest them, and they put them in jail for the night, and the next day they bring Peter and John before the Sanhedrin, this same body of people that just a couple months ago had handed Jesus over to Pilate to be crucified, right? Which means that these are men of power, right? These are men of authority. These are the men that have the opportunity to actually take Peter and John out. And they choose to forbid them on threat of suffering and persecution and probably possibly death not to speak in this name of Jesus any longer, but notice how they respond. This is where I want to center in today on verses 19 and 20. Peter and John replied, judge for yourselves whether it's right in God's sight to obey you rather than God. For we cannot help speaking. We cannot help speaking about what we have seen and what we have heard. I mean, those are some pretty bold words to speak to a couple people who have the authority and the power to take them out. They've warned them. They've threatened them. They've put them in prison. They've begun to persecute them. And yet they say, we have to obey God rather than you. We cannot help speaking about what we have seen and what we have heard. And it's the same words that we hear again in Acts chapter 5, verse 29. Once again, they're in the temple. They've been preaching about Jesus. They've ignored what the Sanhedrin has said to them here. And they see him again. And they arrest them again. And they whip them. And they flog them. And they beat them. And they tell them, you got to stop talking about Jesus. And they say, we must obey God rather than people. That even though they were arrested, they can't help speaking about Jesus. Even though they were, they were put in jail, they can't help preach. Even though they are threatened and flung and beat, they, they, they have to keep talking about Jesus Christ. There is nothing, no amount of pain, no amount of persecution, no amount of suffering, nothing is going to keep them from sharing their faith in Jesus Christ. And in fact, as soon as this story ends in Acts 4.22, they, they're released, they go back to the church, and they tell them about what has happened, and they immediately go to the Lord in prayer, not to ask for deliverance from what's taking place, but to ask for boldness, to keep preaching with courage, even when persecution comes. You know, it made me wonder... What would we have done? You know, if we were in their shoes, what, what, would, what, what would we have done? Would we have had the same boldness? Would we have had the same courage to speak up and say, no, even though we're being persecuted, we're going to keep talking to people about Jesus Christ? Or would we have said, okay, and just shut our lips and become silent? Because the truth of the matter is, we are silent for a whole lot less in our world today. We are silent for a whole lot less, whether that's because we're afraid or or because we're concerned about the damage it might bring to our reputation or whether we might lose this friend or this person. We, We are silent for a whole lot less than they were, but yet these men were bold and courageous in the face of the strongest persecution that they could face to keep talking about Jesus Christ. You know, our tendency is not to speak up. Our tendency as the people of God is to remain silent, to to shut our lips, even though in our membership vows we take a vow of witness, that we say that we will declare to the world the good news of Jesus Christ. Yet the early church understood something. They knew that they had to share no matter what, because great churches are churches that share their faith in Jesus Christ. They had to share. They couldn't stop. No matter what the cost was, no matter how bad the persecution got, they had to keep sharing. And so I ask this question, why? 
Now, why do they feel like they have to keep sharing? Why, why is this something that is so important for them that they're willing to suffer for it? That they're willing to be persecuted for it? That they're willing to be thrown in jail for it? Because it's what we see in Acts all the time. The church is constantly being persecuted. But yet they keep sharing. And they keep sharing. And they keep sharing. So, so why is it that it's so important for them to share where they have to say things like, we can't help but speak about Jesus? And I want to suggest three things for you today. The first is this, that they saw it as an act of sacred responsibility. As an act of sacred responsibility. Look back at Acts chapter 1, verse 8. It was the last words that Jesus spoke to them before he ascended into heaven and he gave them one final charge, one command. He tells them that they are to be his witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. In his final words, he commands them to do one thing, to be witnesses of the faith of Jesus Christ, to be witnesses of the good news, to share their faith throughout the word. And because Jesus was the one who had spoken this to them, they took that very seriously. They took it seriously. It became an act of sacred responsibility. It was something they had to do because Jesus had commanded them to do it. Because Jesus had spoken this word to them. That meant it couldn't be ignored. Right? That meant it wasn't optional. Right? That meant it wasn't something that they could choose to do if they felt like it or if they had the time or if the circumstances presented themselves. It was something they had to do. No matter what no matter the cost, no matter the suffering, no matter the persecution, no matter how intense things got, they couldn't do anything else because Jesus gave them this task. He gave us this task. He, he commanded us to be his witnesses. And because of that, they say this, judge for yourselves whether it's right in God's sight to obey you rather than him. Right? God said this. God said this. It's, it's an act of, of sacred responsibility. We cannot do anything else because God has spoken. You see, the key question of this entire story is one of authority. Authority. One of, one of power. Who is it that has the real authority in the church? Who, who, who is the real authority? Who should we listen to as the people of God? Who is it that we should obey as the people of God? Because the Sanhedrin what looked like they had the authority. Right? They looked like they had the power. I mean, they, and they were exercising that authority. They were exercising that power. Right? They were putting them in a jail. They were giving them orders. They were telling them what they could do and what they couldn't do. It looked like they had the authority. But you see, Peter and John know that they didn't have the real authority. That the real authority, the real authority is found in Jesus Christ and in him alone. In fact, seven times in Acts chapter 3 and Acts chapter 4, we hear that true authority and true power is in the name of Jesus Christ. It's in the name of Jesus Christ. This, this phrase keeps appearing because what Jesus has said matters. What Jesus has commanded us to as the people of God, it matters. And if it matters to Jesus, it needs to matter to us. If God has said it, then it has to be on a priority for us. It has to be what we center on. It has to be what comes first. It has to be everything to us. If Jesus has said it, then we must listen and we must obey and we must follow. And because of that, they realize that they can't do anything else and they have to share because there is no other options. There's no, 
plan B or plan C or plan D. This is God's plan for the church that we are to be his witnesses. I'm reminded of the great evangelist Dwight Moody. It, it, so it's said that he, he, he saw it as such an act of sacred responsibility that he had to share his faith in Jesus Christ with at least one person every single day. This was the practice that he decided he was going to do. And it was about 10 o'clock at night one night, and he realized, I haven't shared my faith with anybody today. And so he went out to the streets, and he started banging on doors, and he started trying to find anybody that he could possibly find. And he found, finally found a man at a lamppost, and he told him all about Jesus Christ because he knew it was important for him to constantly be sharing his faith. You know, here's the problem in the church today. The church takes Jesus' command to share our faith more as a nice suggestion or as a good idea rather than an act of sacred responsibility. Right? It's something that we do if we feel like it. And if we don't get to it, well, it's not that big a deal. But the number one reason the church doesn't grow is because we personally do not share our faith with anybody. The number one reason the church does not grow is not because of the pastor, it's not because of the ministry leaders, it's not because of the staff, it's not because of the board, it's because we do not take the responsibility that God has given us to share our faith with somebody every single day. I mean, just imagine how different the church would be if every person in this room and every person who was watching this stream online would share their faith in Jesus Christ with at least one person every single day. Every single day, without exception. Imagine how much the church would grow if every person took the command to be witnesses of Jesus Christ to the ends of the earth as seriously as these apostles did, as seriously as Dwight Moody did, as seriously as that elderly woman who couldn't see and who couldn't read and who couldn't write did, as seriously as that second baseman did in the second game or the seventh game of the World Series. I mean, if we all took it that seriously, imagine how different the church would be. You see, I, I believe that the reason God added to their number daily those who were being saved is because they were sharing their faith daily with those who needed to believe. Right? It was an act of sacred responsibility for them. They couldn't do anything else. You see, great churches are churches that share their faith. But secondly, they saw it as an act of obedience to God. An act of obedience. I mean, just notice the language that's used here. Judge for yourselves whether it's right in God's sight to obey you rather than God. Or in Acts 5.29, we must obey God rather than men. In both cases, it's an act of obedience to God to share their faith in Jesus Christ. That term obey literally means to, to willfully submit yourself to God's authority. You see, the early church believed to do anything less than sharing their faith every single day was an act of disobedience. If they didn't share their faith, then they were sinning against God. That's how seriously they took this. You see, to stop sharing our faith is an act of willful, conscious sin against God. It's a sin that we need to confess as the people of God. It's a sin that we need to repent of and to begin to go out and to do what God has called us to do because God doesn't command us to something that he doesn't expect us to do. I wonder how the church might be different if we all saw sharing our faith not just as an act of sacred responsibility but as an act of obedience. That's something that God expects us to do.
I wonder how different it would be if we actually believed it was sinful not to share, because I don't think that most of us do. I mean, sometimes that's even hard for me to believe. I take this as just as seriously as the Ten Commandments, just as seriously as any of the other you know, moral things that we would automatically say, yeah, that's sinful behavior, and that's sinful behavior. But to see this as the, in the same weight, in the same category in the eyes of God, because great churches are churches that share their faith in Jesus. And then third, the early church saw it as an act of extreme and urgent importance. Extreme and urgent importance. Look what they say in verse 12. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to people by which we must be saved. No one else, no other name. No one else, no other name. What's that mean? It it means that these are statements of exclusivity, right? Right? If if he's saying there's no one else and there's no other name by which we can be saved, that means there are not multiple ways. There are not multiple paths to heaven. Jesus is, as Jesus said, the way, the truth, and the life. There is no other way to get to heaven. He alone is the way to salvation. And that means it's critical for people to receive this message, to hear this message. It's critical. It's important because they can't be saved without it. And they can't be saved if they don't hear it and if they don't respond to it. It's critical because there is no other way. You see, if Jesus really is the only way to salvation, then that means this is a message that everyone needs to hear. It's a message that our neighbors need to hear. It's a message that our family needs to hear. It's a message that our friends need to hear. It's a message that everyone needs to hear. Because without him, they're perishing. Right? Without Jesus, they are on a one-way collision course with hell. Without Jesus... Our friends and our family and our acquaintances and our neighbors, every person that we pass by is hopelessly lost. You see, just just get this. If we are silent, if we do not share our faith in Jesus Christ, we are effectively sentencing people to their eternal death. I mean, Paul puts it like this in Romans 10. He says, how can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone speaking to them? You see, sharing our faith is critical. They can't stop because there is no other way. They can't stop because the message is too important. They can't stop because it's too urgent. They can't stop because all the people that are in that room with them in that very moment are are heading to an eternal death. And so they have to share their faith in Jesus Christ. You see, if we really care about people, if we really care about people, we have to tell them about Jesus. Because it's incredibly unloving and uncaring to know the way to heaven, to know the way to salvation, and to not speak that message to the person we love. I mean, how much do you have to hate someone not to share the one message that can give them life? The atheist Penn Jillette, you know, from Penn and Teller, he said this, he said, if you believe there's a heaven and a hell, and people could be going to hell or not going to eternal life, and you think it's not really worth telling them this because it would make you you socially awkward, how much do you have to hate someone not to share your faith? How, How much do you have to hate someone to believe that everlasting life is possible and not tell them that? 
I mean, if I believed beyond a shadow of a doubt that a truck was going to hit you and you didn't believe it and the truck was bearing down on you, there comes a certain point that I'm going to tackle you to the ground to save you. And this is even more important. In other words, it's the epitome of hatred to know the truth and not to share it. I'm reminded of the story about Charles Peace. He was a, a man that was a notorious criminal in England. He was executed uh, back on February the 25th, 1879. And on the night of his execution, the Anglican minister in town came down to see him at the prison and was just, just going to share faith with him. He started to, to read to him from the book, The Consolations of Religion. And he read this line. He said, those who die without Christ experience hell which is a pain of forever dying without the release which death itself can bring. And at that moment, Charles completely stopped the minister and he said, look, if I believe what you and the church say, even if England were covered with broken glass from coast to coast, I would walk all over it, if need be, on hands and knees and think it worthwhile living just to save one soul from that kind of death. Right, here's, here's two people outside the faith who understand how urgent and how important this message is to share. But yet we, the people of God, don't understand its urgency and its importance. Why is it that we don't share our faith? And I think a lot of times it's because we don't think we know how. And we don't think we know how, but but notice verse 13, these are unschooled, ordinary men. These were people who didn't receive formal training. These were people who didn't have the ability on their own. They didn't have the strength. They, they didn't think that they had the words to say. But they knew that because the Holy Spirit was with them, that God would give them the words to say. That it wasn't about them. It wasn't about their gifts and their strengths and their abilities. In fact, in the Gospels, Jesus himself tells us that the Holy Spirit will give us the words to say in that moment. Right? Not, not beforehand, not, not in some training class, that he will give us the words to say in that moment moment because when we love people as God loves people and we see people as God sees people it's going to compel us to share with every person that we meet because it's important because there's no other way because there's no other name you see they had to share because it was an act of sacred responsibility they had to share because it was an act of obedience. And they knew that if they did anything else, they were sinning against God. And they had to share because it was critical and important and urgent. It doesn't matter whether we feel we are qualified. The question is, will we step out and do what God is calling us to do and allow him to fill in the gaps, to do what we can't do by ourselves? Because I tell you what, I've had a lot of training, but it terrifies me every time I try to talk to somebody. So my challenge for you this week is to share your faith with at least one person every day. And just see what God does. I bet you the more you do it, the easier it gets. Because great churches are churches that share their faith no matter what. Let's pray. Jesus, we come to you. We come to you, Lord, because we're afraid. We come to you, Lord, because we know we're not ready. We hear these words, and, and deep in our side, we're, we got that little but. And so today, Lord, 
I pray that even this week you would make a way, that you would open doors, that you would help us to see where you're moving and that we would step into those places. Maybe we don't have all the words to say, but one thing we can say is that you've changed us. And so I give, give us the strength, give us the words to say that we might truly begin to see sharing our faith as an act of responsibility, an act of obedience, and an act of incredible importance before you. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us stand today and respond to God in song. Oh, great is our God. So we should worship greatly. No song is too loud, no orchestra too stately. To hail the majesty of our King, so lift your voice loud as we sing. Oh, great is our God. So let our song be endless. So awesome his ways, how could we comprehend them? So we will make it known to our kids, and we will sing about the gracious gifts you give. We will sing your praise and pour forth your fame. We will bless your name. Let everyone give thanks because our God is great. Oh, great is our God, and we cannot contain it. We sing from our souls, affected by His greatness. His mercy covers all that we's made, showing His glory and His grace. We will sing your praise and pour forth your fame. We will bless your name. Let everyone give thanks because our God is great. We will sing your praise and pour forth your fame. We will bless your name. Let everyone give thanks because our God is great. We will sing your praise and pour forth your fame. We will bless your name. Let everyone give thanks because our God is great. Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin? Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? 
Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Leave behind your regrets and mistakes. Come today, there's no reason to wait. Jesus is calling. Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy. From the ashes a new life is born. Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, what a Savior, isn't he wonderful? Sing hallelujah, Christ is risen, bow down before him, for he is Lord of all. Sing hallelujah, Christ is risen. Oh, what a Savior, isn't he wonderful? Sing hallelujah, Christ is risen. Bow down before him, for he is Lord of all. Sing hallelujah, Christ is risen. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Bear your cross as you wait for the ground. Tell the world of the treasure you found. Bear your cross as you wait for the crown. Tell the world of the treasure you found. Amen. And maybe there are some of you who are here today and you've never received Jesus Christ as your Savior. I want to give you the opportunity to do that. So after the service, we'd encourage you 
uh, could just come up to the front and we'd like to pray over you today and uh, give you the opportunity to respond to the good news that Jesus has died and risen for you to forgive you of all your sins. A few announcements as we go forth today. We want to make sure you're sure that you're aware of coming up. Uh, make sure I get this right. Uh, blessing of the schools on Tuesday, the June 1st at 8.30. We're going to be out at Crosby Elementary helping them move into their new building, taking all the teacher supplies, no furniture, so we just need some hands uh, to be able to help move boxes and things like that uh, from you know, a building that's here to a building that's in their back lot. So it, it's, the more hands, the quicker to go. We're looking for about 10 to 20 people. If you can be involved in that at any time, even if it's not for the entire time, come speak to me after the service. Uh, secondly, um, coming up June 5th at 5 o'clock is uh, the farewell celebration for me and my family. We'd encourage you to all be here for that. We'd love to be able to say goodbye in a, in a special way, so be here uh, for that opportunity. That's Saturday night, June 5th at 5. So now go in the name of Jesus Christ to be his people in this world, that you might see Jesus and speak Jesus and be Jesus each and every person that you meet this week. Amen.